right, I hope everyone had a great weekend. Um, back at it today. First things first, the hard copy of your design concept reports are due on Wednesday. 48 hours from this time, there will be a big, huge stack of papers up here. They're due at 4 o'clock. At 4.01, they're late, so send it with someone responsible. You turn in one hard copy per group, and one person in your group is responsible for uploading your report, a PDF of your report, um, to Web Campus by, I believe, midnight Wednesday. Okay. There's lots of seats over here if you guys want. Come on in. They're down front. <laughs> okay. So, your reports are due. Make sure you get to those. Please don't wait till tomorrow night or you'll have a really long night. And then you'll sleep through class on Wednesday. So, try and get started if you haven't already. All right, also coming up, um, CatMe team evaluation number two is due tonight. Okay. Please make sure you get those done and give accurate and truthful responses about your team members. Okay. That's your first line of defense. If you're having some problems, please write about them. They're anonymous to your team members, but Dr. Lacombe and I look through those and we can get a really good idea as how the team are working and if you're having problems, then we can have a meeting or whatnot or try and help you out. So please make sure that you are truthful with the CAPME service. Online safety module and quiz is due tonight at 11.59 p.m. Remember, you pretty much cannot participate with the hovercraft or in lab from now on if you don't take the safety quiz and get 100%. So please make sure you take that tonight if you want credit for it. Watch the soldering video before class. Your skills lab, that's week six, I guess this week. So you'll be soldering in skills lab. So please make sure that you review that video. It should be a fun lab, um, but we don't want anyone getting hurt. Don't burn yourself. Concept report again due Wednesday. Hard copy in class. I would suggest you don't wait till 3.50 to print it out because if the printer doesn't work, you know how printers like to jam and eat your work and all that. Make sure you don't do that because it'll be late. So print it out early, get it done, ready to go. Checkpoint ahead. You guys have a lot due this week <laughs> and next week. Next Thursday or Friday, you have between 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. to come and complete your checkpoint. You'll meet with Dr. Lacombe or me or one of the TAs or all of us over your checkpoint. Make sure that you print out the checkpoint form and you fill out the parts that need to be filled out. I went over it at the end of class last Monday. Please check out the PowerPoint online if you need. The stuff that was in a red box is what you need to turn in or have done okay, when you get here. It's worth 25 points. No more than one team member can be missing. So please make sure that you guys find a time that you can all come. I would suggest that you come as early as possible. If you come at, say, 3 o'clock on Friday, you're in for a long wait. Okay? The, the lines last year got up to about three hours. So if you come in the morning and get it done and out of the way, then you go home and you're done for the day. Right? On that note, there is no class on Wednesday. Next Wednesday, no class. Yes, question. He asked, so do we just come in for that or do we sign up for a day? You just come in, first come, first serve between 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. Thursday and Friday in the lab. Okay. Any other questions about checkpoint? Yes. There is, he asked, there's no main lecture. That is correct. There's no main lecture on Wednesday. Your skills labs, though, still go all week. There is skills lab on Friday. It'll be a zoo in the lab. Just be prepared. <laughs> okay? So you do have skills lab all next week. We have lecture Monday. We just do not have lecture on Wednesday. Any other questions? All right. Skills lab, you need safety goggles starting now. So please get those, bring them to class. If you forget them, you can rent a pair for a dollar. Um, bring your relays, your cut NXT wires, and your strip board from the rental kit. You need those in class or you will not be able to participate. So please make sure that you remember, put that on someone's list who's responsible. Yes, question. Sorry, can you speak a little louder? Or? If you have glasses, as long as I believe they're polycarbonate, then you are okay. Don't wedge your soldering iron from behind, please. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Yes. Yes, the goggles from chemistry should work just fine. 
Anything? I just want your eyes covered and protected. Okay. Anybody else? Questions? All right. Serious topic denoted by the Grim Reaper here. Over 20 people have been caught, um, or well, I can't say caught. They're being currently investigated for academic dishonesty. 20 people. I will remind you what your syllabus says in your student contract. What you sign saying if you cheat in this class, you accept an F in this class, you're done. 20 people have violated this. Well, they're suspected of, we're investigating. Okay. Studying together is okay, it's great. We want you to study together. I don't think you could get through engineering school without having a good study group. Hey, I encourage you guys to work together, so does Dr. Lacombe. But giving someone your homework, like they're like, oh, please, I just, da, 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 something came up, and you hand them your homework, you're like, whatever, I did it. That is cheating. You cannot give away your work. It's in your syllabus. Okay? We consider that cheating. As well as taking someone's homework and copying it, or taking their file, or whatever it is, it's all cheating. Okay? That's how we view it. Don't do it. It's a bad way to get off. Um, to a start here at UNR. Okay? So please, please, please do your own work. Work together, but do your own work. Yes, question? Who is your TA? No. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. He, your TA said that you guys could share the files themselves? That would be working together. If you, I know in the Excel, it's hard to explain something without showing someone what you did. Okay. That's working together, but you need to be sitting at your own computer, typing in your own things, not opening up their file and using it and going, oh yeah, I see how you did that. That makes perfect sense. Okay. You should be able to replicate your work. If I went up to you and I said, well, this if statement is kind of suspect. Write an if statement that does this. You should be able to do that at this point. Something, for example. Okay? So make sure, I guess, that you can defend your homework. That's the bottom line. And don't copy other people's homeworks. Okay? Work together, but separately. All right, anybody else questions? OK. All right. Let's move on with non-dire things. The final track looks like this. Your eyes' hovercraft has to go to the end. Once it gets into the black denoted box at the end, it needs to come back. Okay, that is your problem for the semester. You guys know this by now, I hope. You cannot touch the top or the outside of the walls. If you bumper off them like bowling balls, that's okay. It's probably not great, <laughs> but it's okay. It's legal, but you cannot touch the top or the outsides. Okay? So Dr. Lacombe was, hold give me one second. Dr. Lacombe was um, talking about control systems last week. And I understand he um, didn't get to the last few slides. So I'm going to go over those real quickly before we get to today's topic. But the bottom line is you got to get to the end and back. Okay? And you need some sensors to do that. Okay, question in the back. It can do anything you want. It just needs to get to the end and get back without touching that far wall. So he asked, does it have to turn around or can it go in reverse? So you have an option there. Anybody else? Yes? Do you have to hover at the final competition? Oh, oh, I see. He asked, do you have a, is there a hover portion in the final competition? You just need to get up and going and go back and forth. So no, there's not like a hover for two minutes and then go. Anybody else? Yeah. There might be a what? If you were, it's, it, that would be a different design competition. You guys just have this, this is your, this is your uh, board that you have to, the, the playing field, I guess I should say. Anybody else? All right. Hopefully ideas are coming together since papers are due. Right? <laughs> yes. He's asking, can we do test runs? Yes, indeedy, you can do as many test runs if you want. I suspect you'll do a lot of them. 
the boards are in the lab, so yes, you can practice. Okay. Anybody else? All right, moving on. So, some things to think about. The yellow square here okay, is a light sensor in this case. Okay. Oopsies, sorry. One light sensor. So, placement of that light sensor is a big deal. If you think about, does anyone mountain bike or road bike? Yeah, and probably all you guys drive a car. When you go biking, do you bike like this, staring at your feet? <laughs> if you do, you probably need a really good helmet. Um, mostly we like to look forward and anticipate where we're going. Same with driving a car. You might want to think about that when you design your hovercraft. Okay? <laughs> think about where you're going and where your sensor is going to be placed. That's something you can move around, okay? but it's a design um, challenge for your team. Where do we want that sensor to be? Also. How do you sense the difference in where you are? If you've got one sensor, okay, do you know if you're face to the left or to the right or going forward when you encounter this black line? Do you know where you are exactly? No. It might be a little difficult. Does it matter? Yeah, I think it does. Maybe not. Okay, some other things to think about is just because your hovercraft is facing one direction, these little frictionless things, they like to be difficult. And so it might be facing this direction, but I might be going this direction, or vice versa. So it could be facing right, going left. It might be facing forward and going forward. You don't know with one sensor entirely. So that brings me to a two sensor design. If we had two light sensors, now I can tell if I'm on the white part, if both sensors are on white, then that means I probably still need to go forward because I haven't hit that black box at the end. If my right sensor is on the black and my white sensor is not, then I'm turned a little to the left or I might be turned a little to the right. So where your sensors are placed will help you determine where you are. It's nice to know which sensor has hit the black line first, so that way you can correct yourself if you need to. So these are four possible combinations you could get. Yeah, question. I am sorry, I didn't realize there's a silver strip around, which goes back to Heidi's question as well. Um, the light sensors will pick up that silver strip. It considers it brighter than white, so yes, you have that option also. Thank you. He asked if about the silver strip in the lab down the boards, which I had not noticed. Sorry. Okay. Additional sensors. You guys could also add a third sensor. In your kit, you'll have an ultrasonic sensor. You can maybe sense the end of the board. You have a touch sensor, probably used for something else, but you never know. Okay. So you could incorporate a third sensor if you wanted to. Okay. The idea here is to think about what you would do as a person. If you were, say, sitting on the hovercraft and you had these sensors, what do you want it to do? What would you do if the left sensor encountered black or the right sensor encountered black and all sort of things? So these are the things you need to think about, and we'll do some practice programming. But please start energizing your brains with ideas of how to control your hovercraft. Any questions about that? Yes. She asked, are we going to cover the difference between potentiometers and distance meters? They are different, and it'll get discussed in lab a little bit and when you start building. Totally different things, though. <laughs> okay. All right. So further complicating your control problem, um, you need to know, is your hovercraft robust enough to handle disturbances from ideal conditions? So basically, that means, do I need to start my hovercraft at a precise um, heading so it's facing directly forward? It can't be off in any direction by a millimeter or not, or it's going to mess up. Okay. Are, you, are your light sensors susceptible to the ambient light? How high are they? How low are they? Do your batteries need to output a fixed voltage? Remember, as you lose battery power, your fans aren't going to be spinning as fast. You're going to lose a little lift. Does that matter for you? These are all things you need to consider. Okay. Response times. The NXT and sensors require time to respond. It's pretty quick. Um, but your fans, if you were, say, trying to turn those off, that takes a long time to respond. So these are all just things you need to think about. Um, again, as you decide how you're going to control your hovercraft. 
We're not going to tell you how to do it, but we'll guide you. If you guys have ideas, please come talk to us. All right, the bottom line is the control problem will probably be your biggest headache in capital red letters when designing your hovercraft. So you'll have ideas, testing them will be the headache, but you'll get plenty of time to test them. Okay. All right, today's topic is actually modular design and development. Okay, so I'm going to talk about that for a little while. It's a little bit off topic from your, not off topic, but we're not talking about hovercrafts for the next 30 minutes. We're going to do this. Uh, so modular design. What it means is basically you're subdividing a system into smaller parts or modules. So you have something you're creating, you break it into smaller parts so you can do it easier. Kind of like you break down your design report probably into five different sections and distribute out. Okay? Done in modules. And it's useful if you want to, say, expand your business or your product line. It's useful for maintenance, for customizing things, for upgrading, for recycling. And then sometimes there's regional requirements. Maybe your power source, your plugins here are different than they are in Europe and South America, etc. So we got to design around that. It's nice to have that power source as a separate module. I put up these Nikes. Anyone design their own Nikes? You guys seen that? You can go on their website and you can choose everything you want. They have a basic shoe, right? And then from there, it's like pick your outside casing, pick this, pick that, and you get all these cool different colors. That's modularity in design. The consumer drives what they're producing. They have a basic shoe and they add to it. If their product wasn't modular, we wouldn't be able to do that. Same goes when you go to order a computer. You get on Dell's website, and you're like, I want this operating system, I want this hard drive, I want this battery, I want this memory card, I want, I'm a gamer, so I need this. Those are all your choices. So Dell has a computer set up, and then when the consumer orders, they go back through and they fix the different modules to reflect what you would like. So that's kind of what we're talking about today, is the reason for modularity it goes beyond just us consumers being picky. Okay? And we'll go from there. I've got lots of examples for you guys. So the value of modularity is, um, first off, for develop, development of large-scale products or services. We're going to talk in a minute what happens if you make your own sandwich versus if you're making sandwiches for, say, McDonald's or something. So you need to have modularity in your business if you want to upscale. We're going to talk about management of a product or service performance. It's easier to manage things if things are broken into modules. Okay? Same goes for improvement of diagnostic activities and support for maintenance. If things are done in modules, we can identify problems easier, track them down, and fix them versus having to look at an entire computer. We can look at one part. Okay? And then product or service extension or improvement. So you might want a spin-off of your product, in which case you might want to use parts from the other product and then add to it to make a new product. It happens a lot. All right, so consider the complications or complexities introduced when you are making one sandwich. That's pretty easy. Okay? I've all made a sandwich, I hope. <laughs> so you throw together your sandwich and you take it to the beach and all your friends are like, that looks so good, gimme. <laughs> and you share a bite, <laughs> then your sandwich is gone. So the following week, your friends are like, hey, we're going to the beach, and you're the sandwich guy. <laughs> Make us sandwiches. What's changed? Now, all of a sudden, you probably have to go to Rayleigh's. You got to figure out what kind of meat people like, and there's a vegetarian, so you got to deal with that, right? Things got a little more complex, but it's not bad. There's only six of you. Okay? Then you become the chef of a big restaurant. So you decide your sandwiches are so fantastic that you're going to open a sandwich shop, Jimmy John's. Right? Now what happens? <laughs> Now you have to search out ingredients, manufacturers, to get someone to deliver it. You've got to hire people to work for you. You don't want anyone cutting their fingers. There's all sorts of things going on. Okay? And then after that, you decide, well, I want to be the VP of food services at the Circus Circus. So you went from feeding, say, hundreds of people a day to thousands of people a day. Bigger headache, right? And then last but not least, you end up with your own McDonald's or something like that. You're making tons and tons of sandwiches. Modularity helps. You can see as your product expands, a lot of things come into it. How am I going to produce these? Where am I going to get my supplies? How am I going to pay for it? What happens if one sandwich is bad? How do I identify where the rotten meat is or whatever? You get the point. Okay. All right. So let's pretend it's 1875. Is anyone old enough to have played the Oregon Trail? Yes. <laughs> okay. So you guys recognize this. 
you get your money and you get to go get your supplies. And the guy has oxen, food, clothing, ammo, and spare parts. <laughs> okay, so it's 1875. You take your list to the grocery store. The sole proprietor selects and loads your items. So he's like, oh, hello, Mr. Smith, you're back again. And he loads up the five things that you buy every week. Okay, then you walk, you ride your horse, drive your buggy away with your food supplies. Right? Done. Easy. Okay. So this system worked well because you are one of few customers each day. The proprietor is not pressed for time. You're like one of five people. You come in and he's like, oh, I know exactly what you want. I know how much you want. And I'm going to go pull it off the shelf and hand it to you. The proprietor, so the owner of business, can learn about, order, maintain, and sell only a limited number of products, but that's fine because he's got so few customers. It's okay. It's like making one sandwich. One person um, has all the expertise needed. So he opens his shop, he orders the food, he gathers it for you, he charges you, he fixes things around there, he does everything he needs to do. Okay? Wonderful system for 1865. What about now? <laughs> you think you can go into Rayleigh's and like, hey, I got this list, someone gather everything for me. Not going to happen, <laughs> right? <laughs> Business has boomed. <laughs> Things have gotten bigger. All right, so. First clicker question. Which of the following would best represent the biggest problem with the general store configuration? Small guy doing all the work. One, it wouldn't sustain its properties if the store grows. Two, there would not be any expertise in the store. Three, there would not be any service in the store. Or four, there would be no maintenance for the store. So what is his biggest problem? And you'll have to excuse me while I get the clicker going. All right. Ah. So you're looking for the biggest problem. Five seconds. Let's see what you got. Good. Okay. All right. Option one was correct. It wouldn't sustain its properties if the store grows. It is true that there wouldn't be as many expertise if you got huge. You wouldn't have the deli and then the butcher and then the, I guess that's kind of in the same realm, the produce people and everything else. Um, but the main thing is, is if the store grows, He's got no way to work with that. Okay. So, whoops. Ah, switching the wrong thing. Excuse me. Sorry, guys. A little hiccup. Okay. Problems for the 1800 store scalability. What if the town grows significantly? What if all of a sudden there's a gold rush and he's got, say, 50 people a day coming in? Does he have any way of anticipating what these people want all the time? Can he actually load all these people's groceries up for them and anticipate their orders and get the right things? Probably not. Not by himself. He's on his own, remember. Okay. So scalability is a problem there. Expertise and quality, if the store was to provide a larger variety of products, would he know what was the best pears or what's the best bag of flour? Uh, you know, when you go in the grocery store now, and we have 10 options for pretty much everything. Back then, it was one option. <laughs> so as he grows, does he have expertise? Probably not. He's pretty busy with everything else going on. Diagnostics. Um, how could you know if the proprietor were knowledgeable about the fruit or veggies he's carrying? Um, can you assume that he's actually storing them correctly and you're not going to get food poison? Things to think about. So... We'll go back here. So scalability, expertise and quality, and diagnostics. And here's your clicker question number two. I've got quite a few of these today for you, by the way. If you're sleeping, wake up. Which of the following best represents the definition of scalability? One, the ability to effectively weigh options with a specific business. Two, the ability to effectively organize conditions at the store. Three, the ability to effectively document store profit. Four, the ability to effectively grow the size of the store. Or five, the ability to effectively serve products by weight. 30 seconds. Scalability we're talking about.
Two seconds. Ooh, some people got in there at the last minute. Oh, that was the old one. I have. Let's see. Where did your answers go? Oh, did I give you guys the wrong? Uh oh. Bummer. All right. Boo. His hiss. Yeah. Yeah. Let's try this again. I'll cut down the time. You guys have your answers now? You guys are going quick. Look at that number go. Actually, I can't come back to the time because the other room will be confused. I think there was like 360 responses. Did I go the wrong one again? I bet I did. Question one was, uh, we're going to have to skip this. <laughs> OK. You guys can make fun of me right now because I just did the same thing. Yes, question. Oh, I did it right. OK. The ability to grow the size of the store. Good job. <laughs> wow. Big day. Thanks. Thank you. All right, everyone's awake now. That was completely done on purpose to wake everyone up who was sleeping. Sorry if I broke your nap. Yes. <laughs> you think you, their last one? I will look. If I messed it up, I have video, so I can fix it. Okay? It wouldn't surprise me. All right, moving forward. <laughs> I'm scared to use the clickers now. <laughs> Happy Monday. <laughs> okay. Maintenance. <laughs> so we're back to our sole proprietor, and he's all alone in his store. Okay. How can he conduct repairs on the ice box while attempting to help customers? Remember, business is booming. It's the gold rush. And he's like, ah, I've got so much going on. And he's got to fix the ice box, because otherwise all his product goes bad. That's kind of a problem. And then extensibility. The proprietor decides that he wants a cake shop. Okay. But in order to do that, he actually has to shut down the whole store. Because his store isn't built in modules. It's not, he can't just fix something and he can't just start a new module without shutting down because he didn't set it up from the beginning. Okay? So the bottom line is here, a simple monolithic, monolithic system. Okay? Monolithic means a system not broken down into modules. That's a hint to you later. Monolithic is not a modular system. Okay? Does not handle growth in size or complexity very well. And in many cases, it's just flat out impossible. Okay? So modularity is a good way to set up your business. All right. Which of the following, I'm going to get this clicker question right, but which of the following is not evidence of modularity? Scalability, maintainability, portable, extendable, or diagnosticable? You have a choice. One of these is not. I'm going to make sure. Oh, not evidence. Perfect. All right, ready, go. Ten seconds. Three seconds. Good. 78% of you got it right. The business is not, modularity is not helping with portability. Okay. So we went over each of the others, but not portability. Yes, question in the back. He said, how is that not portable when you can switch up computer parts and move things around? Okay. That doesn't make your business portable. You can't really move your ma Dell manufacturing plant that easily. Okay. Good question. Mainly, also, I went over the other five, and that one I didn't. That was the biggest hint. Question. I can't hear him. Can you guys? Okay, go ahead. Cut. Sorry, could you repeat that? You, <laughs> if you design modularly, you could move one section of the store or port it to the other port, part of the store. Kind of true, but that wasn't where we were going. That's not in the spirit of the question, but yes. Heidi?
Heidi suggested that a bookstore could take part of their business and go to the farmer's market. Yes, but we're talking about an entire business, okay, <laughs> moving and growing and all these things. So maybe I'll rewrite the question next fall. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Obviously, I'm having a clicker disaster today, but whatever. All right. So let's move on from the 1800s, and we need to talk about modular design and complex systems. So again, modules are components which, with, which accomplish dedicated tasks or provide focused contributions to a large scale or complex system. That is a mouthful. Okay. We're taking a complex system and we're breaking it into subparts to make it easier. So I've got a few things we're going to talk about. Um, Boeing 747, their new Dreamliner, automatic transmissions, computers, the new bridge. Have you guys driven over the bridge by Carson? It's kind of nice if you're trying to get to South Lake. All right. So modularity improves multiple things. Okay. The first is the ability to design, develop, construct, and deploy a complex system within a reasonable amount of time. If it takes you 100 years to design a new airplane, it doesn't really do you much good. Right? We've got to be able to do things quickly. Modularity helps with that. It also helps with the ability to optimize the performance of a system. You can get expertise from different, say, engineering fields to work on what they're good at. Right? And that will optimize the performance of a system. It also helps with the ability to diagnose a problem, the ability to maintain a system, and then the ability to improve or enhance a system. So I'm going to give you an example of each one of these in the next few minutes. And I've got some more clicker questions interspersed since they're going so well. <laughs> So for many systems, a monolithic, remember monolithic, mono means one, is non-modular. So if mono means one, and, you're and we're talking about having multiple modules make up a system, that's a good hint to you. Monolithic is non-modular. Approach will not work. If you were trying to make the Boeing 747 without modules or set it up like that, it would be very difficult to complete. All right. So first up is the Boeing 747. This is just an article. It's not important. But they delivered okay, their plane at a cost of $32 billion. Okay. So let's consider the development of this Dreamliner. It took dedicated expertise from many fields. Mechanical engineers developed the structure and working surfaces. Okay. Electrical engineers developed the onboard elect electrical and electronic systems. And then we had computer scientists and engineers that developed systems for monitoring, controlling, and managing the aircraft. The development of the Boeing was broken into modules. And you had experts working on each of these modules. And they come together. And that's how the design came to be, a good design. And that's how things happen effectively and efficiently and in a good amount of time. Also, when we talk about modules, another advantage is we talk about the ability to optimize performance of a system. So for this one, we have, say, an automatic transmission for your car. It took chemical and metallurgical analysis okay, to identify gears and structures that will drive the smoothest and have the most robust performance. Mechanical analysis is looking at the different sizes and gearing and the internal braking and how that's all going to work out so you get smooth transfer between your gear changes. You have computer and electrical engineers okay, that are doing analysis to identify the controls and algorithms for managing users and engines in the transmission driving operations. Did you guys see that Google put out their first driverless car? Yeah, it's kind of neat. That'd be nice. It's like having a driver without having to pay them. <laughs> OK. Next up for modularity is the ability to diagnose a system. Consider this computer. If the computer boots itself but it can't find the operating system, I know I probably have a hard drive problem or something with its interface, and I'm really worried. It's like the blue screen of death. If it boots up properly, but there's no image, there's probably something wrong with my, mo with my monitor or my graphics card. If the computer is otherwise working, but cannot commu communicate with the internet, well, then I have a problem with my network interface card. If it just won't turn on, I probably unplugged it and forgot to plug it back in. <laughs> <All right. laughs> You got to be able to diagnose problems. You guys are going to be diagnosing problems with your hovercrafts for the rest of the semester. You look at it and be like, oh, it's not getting up off the ground. What could be going on? And you got to learn how to troubleshoot these problems. 
And I would suggest that you start thinking about your hovercraft somewhat in modules. So you have your control system, you've got your electronics, you've got your fans, you can look around and see. Troubleshoot. All right. Modularity, I told you, is also good for the ability to maintain a system. For example, bridges, roadways, and tunnels um, are developed and built in sections so they can be replaced individually. You don't want to tear down a billion dollar bridge because one section has a problem. You can fix it in sections. Same goes for water and sewer systems. Sometimes you have to get the sewer pipes from your house to the road replaced. Okay. Better that than the entire neighborhood or you're going to cost yourselves a ton of money. Okay. Um, traffic control systems also broken into modules and can be fixed in various sites. The cost is always less to replace the modules than it is to replace the whole system. And that's part of modularity. It's cost effective and it's more efficient. Easier to fix things, easier to maintain. The modularity also provides the ability to improve or enhance the system. So consider a high rise building. Okay. Say the earthquake codes get enhanced and your building needs to um, be retrofitted. That's possible. Okay? For management of light and temperature, you could put in double-paned or triple-paned windows. You could just hang up curtains too. <laughs> okay? But you can change those things. That's part of a module. The windows are a modular part of your building. You can also improve the drainage in and around the building with various plumbing. You can Change out the electrical components. A lot of the lights at UNR now are automatic. When you walk in the room, they pop on, save energy. Okay? That was changed, obviously retrofitted in a lot of these buildings. Um, for overall efficiency and security, computerized control and monitoring can be installed. I don't know if you guys seen that company. There's, I think it's local, but they basically hook up your house to your iPhone so you can leave and you can still lock your doors and turn down your heat and, I don't know, check if anyone's come and tried to break in, all that good stuff, all from your iPhone. Pretty neat. All right, you guys got to pay attention to this one because you guys got a clicker question coming. Modular design development of large scale or complex systems. Basically, modules are small subsystems or components of the big system. Okay? And they're dedicated tasks and they provide focused contributions. So that way expertise can work on what they're good at. Modularity provides the ability to design, develop, construct, deploy, diagnose, maintain, enhance, and optimize the operations of a complex system. And last but not least, for many large-scale or complex systems, a monolithic or non-modular approach will not work. So modules, if you design things in modules, you're helping yourself out with scalability, you're helping yourself out with maintenance, with allowing consumers to make choices, allowing yourself to fix things and troubleshoot problems and all that good stuff. Okay. So modular development is good stuff. Here's your clicker question. Hopefully I can get this right. <laughs> a modular system, sorry, which of the following is most correct? Okay, most correct. One, a modular system is by definition a monolithic system. Two, a modular system is by definition not a monolithic system. Three, a modular system works well but cannot be scaled. And four, diagnosing a modular system is roughly equivalent to diagnosing a non-modular system. Ready, go. What is going on? All right. <laughs> a modular system is by definition not monolithic. So what I leave you with today is I leave you with 10 minutes of borrowed time. <laughs> Because you have a ton to do, please make sure you meet with your group and get your design concept report finished. Have a good week. If you have questions, come up and ask.